Well, good morning. It's good to see you guys. Thanks for being here. That last song's a good one, right? It challenges us. It makes us really begin to think, what do we believe about God? I mean, it talks about you turn graves into garden, and our whole series is beauty for ashes and all this. So this morning, close your eyes for just a moment, and here's what I want you to do. Think. If money wasn't an issue, if age or health wasn't a concern, what would you love to do? Or what would you love to see happen? What would you love to do? Or what would you love to see happen? Think about that for just a moment. Just like personally. Yes. Well, just any way you want to answer it. World peace. <laughs> World peace. All right, anybody want to share? may be very personal. You may not want to. Oh, yeah. that's, that's all right. Somebody say it. What do you I'm think? Sorry. I get, I buy new hair. Not new hair for <laughs> Tim. Okay. There we go. New hair. <laughs> yeah. Anybody? Travel around the world. Travel around the world. That's not bad. Yep. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Get a PhD, okay. Aspirational there, that's good. A month with all my family and no agenda. Okay, a month with all my family and no agenda. Awesome. Now you don't have to share this next part out loud, but here's the question. What keeps that dream from happening? Oh, I know yours, Nancy, it's money, right? Be my, mine too, new hair, Tim, it's money, I know. It's fine. <laughs> Maybe the science isn't there yet, you know. <laughs> but think about that for just a moment. Whatever that dream was, what keeps that from happening? And maybe even possibly as you think about that dream, as you think about maybe it was, you know, spending a month with family with no agenda. In that dream, you also begin to think about maybe family members that wouldn't be able to be there. You know, maybe those that are no longer with us, those maybe broken relationships that would prevent others from coming. You know, it's, easy, it's interesting when you begin to think about those dreams or you begin to think about what if, you, you can easily begin to punch holes in it. You can easily begin to see that um, a lot of things in our lives, the things that may, may, we may want to happen, the things we may want to see come to pass, sometimes it's things outside our control that keep those things from happening. Sometimes it is in our control, but life happens to us. And sometimes, you know, it's by choice. I mean, you know, traveling around the world. That sounds amazing, right? I still have a five-year-old at home. Now, that was by choice, and I wouldn't change a thing. But, you know, I've been parenting since I was 22. That's a long time. Not, you know, it is a long time. But, you know, sometimes it's not by choice. Sometimes illness happens. Sometimes relationships break down. Markets collapse. People die. You know, we learn what coronavirus is. <laughs> Doesn't that change a lot? And as much as we may love control, we don't have to live here very long to realize how little of that we actually do have. And if we aren't careful, what will happen is these dreams, these things that we kind of hope for and dream for, they can evaporate right before our eyes and we'll be left kind of empty handed. And you know, part of the problem with that is that if you're a follower of Jesus, when that happens, it's very easy for us to sit back and go, Okay, so where is God in all of this? I mean, is anybody willing to say, I've had that thought before? If you're breathing, you probably should say yes. I mean, I can, I can remember years ago, even, you know, a um, friend of mine reached out to me and said, hey, I've got a job opportunity for you. And he planted this vision and this dream and this idea. And he's like, let's do this together. And I mean, it was a months long process and, and prayed about it and sought God and really began to dig in and say, okay, let's, this could be fun trying to build something together. And we, and we did that for a while. And then as part of that season, I can remember about four years in, he said, oh, and by the way, now I'm leaving. And I was like, oh, 
Okay, so this wasn't part of my plan. This wasn't what I had envisioned. I mean, I had left a pretty decent banking career. My family had moved across two state lines to a state where winter never ends. I mean, if today is any evidence of that. You know, and I think about that in this dream that we had of doing something. And the way we envisioned that dream just kind of evaporated. It was gone. And honestly, in that moment, I felt a bit hopeless. I felt a bit... um, confused. I was trying to figure out where I was and what I was supposed to be doing. I mean, I thought, I thought the whole world was going to collapse. I thought, how am I going to provide for my family? And even in that moment, it was the moment of greatest darkness in my life because God seemed so distant. I mean, I can remember a 30 day period where I prayed the same prayer every stinking day for 30 days, crying out to God. Just say, God, where are you? What am I supposed to do? What is going on here? And there was silence. And the dream had evaporated and the the idea of what we were supposed to, what I felt like we were supposed to do was gone. But I did keep praying and I kept seeking And I tried to see what was God going to do. Now, if you go back to your dream for just a moment, and I want you to think, even if it hasn't come to pass, what if I told you that God says that he's going to make it happen? What if God asked you right now, that dream you have, you think it can happen? If God asked you that question, how would you answer God? God says, that dream I'm going to bring it to pass. What would you say God to God if he said, do you think it can happen? You don't have to raise your hands, but how many of you think, oh, I'd be like, yes, God. How many of you think I'd be like, I don't know, God. Kind of depends on where the dream lies, right? If the dream is feeling pretty dead, you're probably like, yeah, I, don't, I don't know, God. Isn't that interesting? Now, I'm not telling you God is saying this morning your dream is going to be fulfilled But I want us to think about how do we respond to God in those moments? You see, we've been traveling along this Lenten season, and we've been looking each week at how God does exactly what we sang about in that last song and what's on the screen, beauty for ashes. And I just want to give a quick recap of where we've been, you know, what we've looked at. And we began looking at how temptation and sin, as terrible as it is, is a way that God reveals God's love to us and the God's immeasurable grace that he pours out on us. And then we looked at how we, ha- we can even have a crisis of faith. And in that moment, it can be so difficult and challenging. But it's in that moment that God reveals more of himself to us and we are invited to experience more of God through that crisis of faith. We looked at how suffering and difficulty and trials actually is an opportunity for God to reveal his provision And then we've also looked at how in our own nature and in our own character, our physical sight might be the thing that's actually causing us to miss God's insight. And that's, we're actually going to kind of build on that today. And if you've missed any of these messages, let me go, let me encourage you to go back. They're very encouraging. They're very hopeful. They're on our website and podcasts and all that good stuff. And today we're going to piggyback off that last one. The physical sight might miss God's insight. Because not just seeing as God sees, but then how do we witness the miracle of God bringing to life the dead places in our lives? In the Old Testament, there's a book called Ezekiel. It's very long. It can be very long to read, just to be honest. But Ezekiel was a prophet during the, the time of the Babylonian captivity. The people had been there a while, most likely 10 years or more. They were taken from their home. They're prisoners, basically, in a land. They have rulers over them, and it's not where they want to be. It's not what they thought life was going to be. And they've been there a while. They've seen their temple destroyed, the place that represented God's presence to them. Their city was plundered. Their leaders had been put in chains. And their family and friends had either been killed or dragged away in chains to this God-forsaken pagan land. And understandably, the people in this moment They weren't very hopeful. They'd kind of lost hope, lost heart. Their dreams were shattered. Their hope was destroyed. And then we have this very interesting interaction between God and Ezekiel. It's found in Ezekiel chapter 37. And God shows Ezekiel something here 
that is going to hopefully restore hope and going to remind God's people then, and hopefully us today, that even when all seems lost, God is still in the business of bringing things back to life. So let's look at this. First 14 verses in Ezekiel 37. It says this. Ezekiel's talking here. He says, The hand of the Lord was on me, and he brought me out by the Spirit of the Lord, and he set me in the middle of a valley, and it was full of bones. He led me back and forth among them, and I saw a great many bones on the floor of the valley, bones that were very dry. God asked me, son of man, can these bones live? I said, sovereign Lord, you alone know. Then he said to me, prophesy to these bones and say to them, dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. This is what the sovereign Lord says to these bones. I will make breath enter you and you will come to life. I will attach tendons, tendons to you and make flesh come upon you and cover you with skin. I will put breath in you and you will come to life. Then you will know that I am the Lord. So Ezekiel says, I prophesied as I was commanded. And as I was prophesying, there was a noise a rattling sound, and the bones came together, bone to bone. I looked, and tendons and flesh appeared on them, and skin covered them, but there was no breath in them. Then he said, God's saying, or Ezekiel says, prophesy to the breath, prophesy, son of man, and say it. This is what the sovereign Lord says, come breath from the four winds and breathe into these slain that they may live. So Ezekiel says, I prophesied as he commanded me and breath entered them and they came to life and stood on their feet, a vast army. Then God said to me, son of man, these bones are the people of Israel. They say our bones are dried up and our hope is gone. We are cut off. Therefore prophesy and say to them, this is what the sovereign Lord says. My people, I'm going to open your graves and bring you up from them. I will bring you back to the land of Israel. Then you, my people, will know that I am the Lord. When I open your graves and bring you up from them, I will put my spirit in you and you will live. And I will settle you in your own land. Then you will know that I, the Lord, have spoken. I have done it, declares the Lord. Any zombie lovers out there? Walking Dead, Night of the Living Dead kind of stuff. I mean, this is kind of what we're looking at here, right? I mean, this is, this is some kind of crazy dream. I mean, as you read this, you kind of want to go, what mushrooms had Ezekiel been taken right before this happened? Now, I say that jesting because I want you to know God did speak to him in a vision. And God continues to speak to people even today in visions and dreams. So we don't want to discount that or assume that God doesn't continue to speak this way. He does. But what a start for Ezekiel. I mean, back and forth in a valley of just utter devastation, bones that are described as very many and very dry. I mean, anybody ever been to the catacombs in Paris? Nobody here? I went to Paris years ago. Okay, got a few. I've been to Paris. I had the privilege of going years ago, but I did not go to the catacombs. Check out this picture. That's what it looks like. Who, who, anybody signing up today? Let's go. You know, it's got me too. I'd be there. Not a problem. Or even this artist's rendering of that moment. There's Ezekiel. Kind of freaky, right? I mean, this is kind of unnerving, unsettling. I mean, what we're looking at here is the potential of where a major battle took place, where an army was absolutely devastated and destroyed. And it wasn't yesterday. This is a long time ago because this, there's no flesh left. All we see is bones and they are dry and they're flaking off and they're about to turn to dust. I mean, you're talking about setting a scene and a picture of absolute hopelessness, absolute hopelessness. I mean, you're looking here. I mean, this, been, this has been here long enough that the vultures have come and picked it clean, as have the wild animals. And God wants Ezekiel to know there's no confusion here. He tells him, he says, these bones right here, they represent Israel. This is Israel. Don't you love it when the Bible explains it that clearly to us that we can understand and you can understand that, right? I said they've been there over 10 years. They've, they've been dragged from their homeland. They've seen this devastation. They've seen this. And they're sitting there in this moment wondering, when is, has God completely forgotten us? I mean, if you were to put yourselves in their shoes, what thoughts do you think they would have? What would be going through your mind? Forgotten. forgotten. Absolutely forgotten. Anything else? Abandoned. 
Hope was, yeah. Dead. Dead. Yes. You think I want to die? Just take me out. It'd be better than staying in this horrible position that I'm in. I mean, would you maybe begin to question even God's love for you? Absolutely. I thought, God, God, I thought you loved us. I thought we were your chosen people. So how do you resolve this with where I am in this place of utter desolation? Or maybe you begin to question God's character. God, I thought you were all powerful. I thought everything was under your control. I thought everything was in your power. Maybe you're not even strong enough to overpower these silly Babylonian gods. Because, I mean, look where we are. That'd be a, you know. Or maybe you'd begin to say, "Uh, God's just done with us. Or maybe it would be even, can I ever trust God again? It's heavy, isn't it? It's very heavy. But even as I say those things, I want you to begin thinking about your own life. Have you ever spoken or thought those things in your own life? Where you felt abandoned and hopeless and you doubted your trust in God and you wonder if he'd forgotten or abandoned you. You'd wondered if you could really know God as the all-powerful sovereign God because of where you currently were. You see, what I love about this is that God knows us. And God knows where these people are. He knows where we are. He created us. He knows how thoughts like this can consume our minds. So he asks Ezekiel a very critical and important question. What's the question? He says, can these bones live? How would you have answered that? No. <laughs> It's a very honest answer, right? No, I don't think so. I mean, there's a lot that's going to have to happen before these bones can come back to life. I mean, on this side of history, knowing what Ezekiel saw, it's easy. Oh, yes, God, you can do that. But I, what we don't get in this passage is Ezekiel's tone. What was his tone of voice right there? Anybody else curious about that? I mean, was he sarcastic? I mean, could have been like Brent, you know? Brent, can these bones live? <laughs> God only knows. I don't know, you know. Maybe it was confident. Sovereign Lord, you know. Or maybe it was just resignation. <laughs> God, I don't know anything anymore. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Wouldn't you like to have known his tone of voice? The practical scientific answer is what Amy said. No, dead bones don't come back to life. But did you see what Ezekiel said? In his answer, even though we may not know the tone, even in a hopeless state, he can say this, Sovereign Lord, you alone know. I mean, even just the way he addresses God reveals so much about what he's thinking in that moment. He says the word sovereign. What a sovereign. Sovereign is one with majesty, one with authority. And then he says the word Lord, which is Yahweh, the name of God that is personal and covenantal. Now just think about those two things as you put those together. The personal covenantal God with majesty and authority. What is Ezekiel saying in that moment just by addressing God as sovereign Lord? He's given the answer right there, isn't he? He's given the only answer. You are God. You are not limited you are, there are ways with you even when we can't see a way. You are not limited by a valley of dry bones, God. You are the one who exists and causes all things to exist. And Ezekiel may be in that moment saying, I don't know the full answer, but I know the one who does. So sovereign Lord, you know, you know. And then God does something amazing. I don't, this is the part, honestly, about God that I really don't understand because he brings Ezekiel into this process. And he says, Ezekiel, speak to the bones. Speak to them. And then he does. And wouldn't you have loved to have been there? Wouldn't you have loved to, to hear the rattling and these bones start coming back together and the foot bone connects to the leg bone? Mm -hmm. 
and the leg bone connects to the knee bone. And yeah, you know the song, right? And then Ezekiel notices something, though. All this is happening. These bones are coming back together. Tendons and flesh is coming upon them. And then look again at what verse 8 said. It says, I looked, and tendons and flesh appeared on them, and skin covered them, but there was no breath. Something was still missing, because without the breath, there was no life. What I want you to see here is a callback to Genesis chapters 1 and 2, where God created man out of the dust of the earth, and we have this picture of humanity being shaped and formed. But even after humanity was shaped and formed, something then was still missing, because it tells us in Genesis that then God breathed into his nostrils, Adam's nostrils, the breath of life. What a beautiful picture. And such a word of caution, a word of warning that things can look alive on the outside, that things can look right on the outside, but there, it can be flesh and bones, but it can still be dead on the inside. If only Jesus had said something similar to this in the New Testament, where he looked at those religious people and he said, you are full of dead men's bones. How critical the breath is. And the same God who breathed life into humanity at creation is the same God who tells Ezekiel to speak to the breath, the ruach, that nice Hebrew word, a Hebrew word that appears nine times here, and it's translated three different ways, wind, breath, and spirit. And if after the wind, the breath, and the spirit enters those lifeless bodies, guess what happens? They come to life. It's that spirit, it's that breath that reanimates them, that gives them the life. Isn't it beautiful? It's beautiful. The story in the New Testament is recorded in John's Gospel that I think parallels this one. We don't have time to get deep into it, but it's in John chapter 11. Jesus has a friend. His name is Lazarus. Lazarus gets sick. His sisters send word to Jesus and say, oh, he's about to die. You need to get here. Jesus intentionally waits a couple of days before heading to their house. And during this time, Lazarus dies. And he's buried. He's put in a tomb, stone put over in front of it. And when Jesus shows up at the house, he's greeted by Martha. And she says, oh, Jesus, if you'd been here, he wouldn't have died. But then she says to him, but I know that even now God will give you whatever you ask. I was reading that this week and I thought, you know, there's a real similarity here between what Martha says and what Ezekiel says. God, sovereign Lord, you alone know. Both of them have the same understanding of who they're dealing with. That death, physical death, the death of hopes and dreams really will cause us to examine what we believe about God. Does he care? Can he act? Will he see me through this? And both responses, Ezekiel and Martha, are both showing a trust and a faith in God, even when they may not know how. A little later, Mary comes to Jesus. She seems a bit more emotional than Martha. She throws herself at the feet of Jesus, and she says to him, if only you had been here, he wouldn't have died. If only. Powerful words right there, right? If only. I wondered how often do we get caught up in our if onlys in our own life that contribute to the death that we feel in our lives and the dreams. If only I'd gotten that job. If only my parents had loved me. If only I hadn't been abused. If only my loved one hadn't died. And often that's where it ends. But imagine in that moment with the conversation with Mary, Martha, Jesus, if that's where it ended. If they'd looked at Jesus and just said, but don't worry about it, it's too late. If Ezekiel said, don't, it's too late, God, it's too far gone. But with Mary and Martha and Ezekiel, they all experienced something that Jesus was going to show them that with him, it is never too late. Life may not always look like what we expect, but it is never too late for Jesus to bring life, ever. 
to redeem whatever brokenness, whatever garbage that we have experienced in this broken, fallen, sinful world, even when and if it may be a result of our own stupidity. It's never too late for Jesus. If you keep reading John 11, you see that Jesus is moved with compassion. I love that. He's, he's, he's there. He's with them. He does not, this distant God, this stoic God that's just kind of standing far off. In fact, that's where we get the shortest verse in the Bible, John eleven thirty five. 35. Jesus wept. And it says, and deeply moved, he approaches the tomb. He tells them to move the stone. He's going to do something. Martha's like, oh, but Lord, he's going to stink. You know, love that. And it says there that Jesus prays, Father, I thank you that you've heard me. I know that you always hear me, but I said this for the benefit of the people standing here, that they may believe that you sent me. When he said this, Jesus called out in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. And the dead man came out, his hands and feet wrapped with strips of linen and a cloth around his face. And Jesus said to them, take off the grave clothes and let him go. Some parallels here to Ezekiel, isn't there? Bones coming back to life, movement coming from this tomb. Could you imagine being there and watching that body? That'd be a little freaky. (laughs) And there he was. You know what Jesus said next? Unwrap him. (laughs) I'm sure in that moment they needed to be told that because they're probably there with their mouths open like... What just happened? Hey, guys, could somebody let the man go? (laughs) This is the fifth Sunday of Lent. We've only got two weeks before Easter. And here we absolutely see beauty from ashes, don't we? What a beautiful story. You know, it's easy for us to feel like the Israelites in Babylon or maybe Mary and Martha staring at a tomb. And let's not soften this. This isn't some metaphorical hope lost or metaphorical death. No, this is real. These people were genuinely experiencing hopelessness and death. They had great loss. Like those bones in the valley, their hope was just dry, dusty, picked over with nothing remaining. You see, we sometimes in church like to sugarcoat things and just, oh, following Jesus is great and everything will be roses and sunshine and you don't ever have to worry about anything. Is that anybody's experience here? Death is real. And I asked you in the beginning about your dreams. Where have you seen death in your life? Maybe it's been a literal death. And you still feel the grief, but maybe it is the death of a dream. This morning, I want us to hear the words of the Lord. He has not forgotten. He is not indifferent. God cares. And his words, I want us to experience, is his ruach, ruach, his breath that brings life. You see, Jesus at the tomb of whatever death you've experienced and see the one that's deeply moved and troubled in spirit. See the Savior who weeps with you and realize that as it was and is and always will be, it is a God who brings life from our dead places by the power of his word and the receiving of his spirit. A couple things here as I close. The first is just simply this. The spirit is critical. There is no life without the Spirit. There is no life without the breath of God being sown into our lives, breathed into our lives. I mean, I love this image and picture. Even in the end of John, you see this image of Jesus with his disciples, and it says he breathes on them, and they receive the Holy Spirit. And we see the mighty rushing wind in Acts, the day of Pentecost, and how that is life-giving. And I just can't help but wonder, how often do we try to settle for cheap imitations and run after pseudo-life? thinking these things are going to bring about life, that we can do it on our own, we can find fulfillment in our own activity, in our own religious duty in these things. Or often we just stay busy because if we think if we stay busy enough, I won't have to face the emptiness, I won't have to feel, and I can ignore the dead places. Or we try to self-soothe or self-medicate, or we try to you know, fill our lives with entertainment or even food or these things. And we're really just missing the Spirit of God. 
The Apostle Paul, in his letter to the Jewish and Gentile Christians in Rome, he reminds us of this. He says, but if Christ is in you, then even though your body is subject to death because of sin, the Spirit gives life because of righteousness. And if the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, He who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies because of His Spirit who lives in you. Did you catch that? Did you see what Paul is saying? In two weeks, we're going to be celebrating the resurrection of Jesus. And Paul is saying the same power that raised Jesus from the dead is the same spirit that can raise and resurrect the dead places in our lives. Even when we are completely hopeless, even when we really have no faith, when everything seems desolate and gone and defeated, the spirit of God can still bring life. And did you notice why these things were happening Did you notice why Ezekiel had this vision and the bones are coming back and why Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead? So that they may know you. That's a critical piece of this. God does these things not just because he says, oh, you need them. He does them because he wants us to know, see, and experience him and his power, and to connect with him, the one who made us, the one who shaped us, the one who loves us, despite of all all of our failures and weaknesses and goofiness and brokenness. He does these things so that we can know him. Yeah. (laughs) So one final note. Notice too, both in Ezekiel's vision and in the story of Lazarus, the importance of other people in this process. Did you catch that? Yep, it was the power of God that did the resurrecting, the word of Jesus that brought Lazarus from the tomb. But for whatever reason, God says, Ezekiel, I want you to be a part of this. What a privilege. And as Lazarus comes out, like I said, Jesus needs to look at them and say, hey, take those grave clothes off him. Death still clung to Lazarus. He needed others to help him walk in his new life. Isn't that amazing? And that same God is inviting us to be a part of the resurrecting that he is still doing in our world today. So I just close by asking this. Are we willing to face the dead areas in our lives? Do we believe God cares and God can resurrect those areas that have died? What may appear dead to us is not dead to God, and he is still in the resurrection business You see, the story I shared in the beginning about me, my dream, the dream that I was asked to be a part of, yeah, it completely crashed and burned, even to the point of losing a 10-year friendship after it. It was kind of wild. But it was here at Ashworth, and that season I went through was one of the hardest of my life. Uncertainty, unclear what I should do, didn't know what the future hold. Little did I know that God would take a dream that died and do something honestly I never considered. Now, if you were to ask me in that moment, what do you want? I'm sure I could have come up with a hundred other things that would not include being pastor of this church. But those crazy people 12 years ago at Ashworth asked if I would step in. In that moment, I had clarity. I thought, okay, yeah, this is what God wants. Six months later, they asked me to become the lead pastor. You see, what I thought was dead and lost wasn't. It just shifted, and God breathed his life-giving spirit into a new dream. Who needs to hear this message today? Who needs to hear the message that whatever's dead in us, God can resurrect? It may not be like we think. It may not be like it was, but it can be resurrected. Who needs to hear the message today that maybe you're Ezekiel, Or maybe you're the people Jesus spoke to and the message of God for you today is go to someone that you know is struggling, that you know has no hope, and you be the one, like Ezekiel, to speak the words of life. You be the one to go cut off the grave clothes, the death that is still clinging to them and help them walk in newness of life. Why does God do that? I don't know, but praise God he does. Praise God that he gives us that ability. So I'm going to ask the worship team to go ahead and come back. And as they lead us in a final song, I want to encourage you. If you need hope, if you feel the dead places in you, will you just turn to somebody next to you? You can find me. Liz is at the back. You can find Matthew. You can find just about anybody in the room. 
and just maybe have them pray for you. You see, in the John passage, what I didn't read to you was the famous words that Jesus spoke, where he said to the people, he said, I am the resurrection and the life. This morning, I want you to hear his words to you as Jesus looks at you and as you feel broken and as you feel dead. And he says to you, Jesus is saying to you this morning, I am your resurrection and I am your life. Let's pray.